everyone. Welcome to the Intermediate Track Breakout Session. My name is Meg Hamalpani, and I'm a product manager at Google. I'm previously working on TensorFlow and currently leading machine intelligence on Chromebooks. I will be your moderator today and look forward to getting started. First, we're going to hear from Laura, a software engineer previously at Microsoft, um, who will share a little bit about her journey into machine learning. Laura, please take it away. Hi, everyone. My name is Laura Scate, and I'm super excited and happy to be here with you today. I'll be presenting a tale of two journeys. So the first tale is about software engineering. And here I can tell you a few tricks points on my career of software engineering. The first one is when, and when I was a kid and a teenager, um, I was a math lover and teach friends and classmates to pass their final term exams. Then I enrolled into computer science. And in 2012, I moved to Europe and uh, did a master's degree. And then after that, I started working as a software engineer in Europe. In 2016, I joined Workday as a software engineer to work on the data warehouse team. And where I have my first experience uh, working with data at the scale and distributed systems. Then in 2020, I joined Microsoft as a software engineer as well to work in the authentication stack for worldwide services like such as Skype, Xbox, and so on. Now I move on into that second tale, which is my tale on ML engineering. So in 2019, I continue working in Workday, but this time I moved to a new team, uh, which is the ML platform team. In there, we were creating a new brand uh, ML platform from scratch to process data securely and perform aggregation using a streaming platform such as Apache Flink. In 2020, I left Workday and decided to embark on a self-study journey so I could become uh, finally an ML engineer. New opportunities came along with this. I was being a technical reviewer for Lawrence Moroni book, AI for uh, an ML for coders. And in 2021, uh, I did a, K, a Kaggle diving into practice, uh, to practice more, sorry. And um, two more ML reviews came along. Next, in a couple of weeks, I'm super excited to be joining an AI program at Stanford. How did I knew, and maybe how you can knew if machine learning or data scientists or data science is a, a good uh, path for you? I started doing a retrospective on my career journey, and this helped me realize what will be the best path for me. In my case, I started looking like, okay, I always love math. I been always working with data, data engineering, handling of data, relational databases. And then I was also working as a software engineer. So I started like, okay, I, maybe I can mix these three um, topics and uh, be a data scientist or a machine learning engineer. How you can get started and how and um, how you can get started, and I'm gonna show you now how you can get started as well. So my first path or my first step in this journey was to uh, do the um, data analyst and a degree in Udacity, and I also started uh, preparing myself by actually knowing how to handle data how to do data cleaning, data wrangling, uh, dealing with missing, value, missing values, uh, doing EBA to actually know the distribution of my data, and then um, things like uh, data visualization. And for that, I actually recommend the Python for the Data Analysis book from Wes McKinney. Next, and this is a journey which is really a little bit more, um, if you want to be more curious about what is going on in ML in the background, I will recommend you to do the 1606 Linear Algebra course by Gilbert, Gilbert Strand in MIT courseware. It was really good. I actually um, could see everything both from what is a vector, what is a matrix, the operation between them, um, how you can solve a system, system of linear equations. And last but not least, you can continue if you're more uh, curious with mathematics for machine learning in Imperial College of London, which again, is touch topics like linear algebra, multivariate calculus, and principal component analysis, which is really good uh, technique for doing uh, dimensionality reduction. Now, 
if you want to actually start do, uh, learn by doing, you could go to TensorFlow tutorials. And I can tell you that this is, these tutorials are really great. And it's, um, it goes through a, a lot of topics where you can actually do image and text classification, regression, regression. you know, how to do your high performance and tuning of your model, save it, and maybe you can deploy it to the cloud or in your mobile phone. Now I'm going to tell you my favorite uh, journey, which is a little bit more on to intermediate or hands-on, which is um, from the most basic to the most complex, uh, three courses that I did, and I truly recommend uh, each of them. The first one is the TensorFlow Developer Professional Certificate, which actually when you do it, you are preparing yourself for to do the certification. It gives you an overview of the TensorFlow APIs and Keras by going through multiple topics like CNNs, NLP, sentiment analysis, and time series. You can build simple models to the more complex ones. Then moving on, I did the Udacity Deep Learning and a degree as, a pa as part of a scholarship. Similar to the uh, TensorFlow course, which I already talked about, you will do a deep dive into deep learning in this one, but this time using PyTorch as an MM framework. And the, the difference between this and the previous is you are diving into more topics about deep learning like neural networks, RNAs, GANs, and to lastly deploying your model to the cloud. Last but not least, my favorite of all, and probably you know about this one, is the machine learning by Stanford course. I remember trying this course in 2015 and 16, and I didn't have a clue of what I was seeing. I, was, I wasn't sure why I needed to learn this. Um, then I come back in 2019 and did it again, and this time with more in-depth knowledge, I was able to go through the course and assignment successfully. And truly is one of the best courses I have seen in all my life. So it's not only about ML, but analytical thinking and how to apply ML into real world situations. Totally recommended if you want to do a deep dive. Last uh, in these um, topics of, of how you can get into ML is exploring your ML persona. It's about uh, getting to practice, um, get familiar with Kaggle, and then actually, for example, in my case, I explore my own topics of, topics of interest, right, uh, by working on three projects. These are examples of three projects that I work on. The first one, an autoencoder, learning why autoencoders are useful, for example, data denoising or dimensionality remote. Uh, the reductions. I remember struggling a bit with the process of building the decoder. At the end, it was just the dimension of it. Then I move on into the DG recognizer. Everyone knows about the MNIST dataset, but in this time, instead of doing it like everyone was doing, I wanted to explore the TensorFlow APIs for data handling. So I explored like things like the CSV dataset, which allows for a better data manipulation, learn about caching datasets in memory so it will be faster on, inter on iteration and training. And one advice that I can tell you here is don't get too hung up on trying one method only, explore a little bit more. Last but not least, the book classifier, uh, book cover classifier project. And I am a book lover and I wanted to pull a data set of book covers from Amazon and try to see if I can build a classifier that as soon as I put the cover, it actually shows me the topic that I was reading, like tech or um, science fiction or nonfiction. Um, it turns out that this spread wasn't a little bit successful because the image were thumbnails. So I couldn't see um, the model was, wasn't able to recognize the features uh, properly. So if you have a data set that you can recommend, you can uh, ping later about that. All right. Now um, I'm going to move on into an important site, which is not a technical one, but something that I think is important when you are exploring a new area in your career is having a mentor and a community to rely on. Finding a mentor is important because basically you are getting motivation and guidance. These people could help you when you're stuck and they challenge you to be better. Then uh, you also can uh, get into the community. And one of the reasons why is because it's a good good checkpoint on, on seeing how far are you and if you have any gaps on your knowledge. So you can do talks, you can write articles, participate in online communities. One of my favorite communities is the Dota Talks Club at Alexi Gigoref and ML Tokyo Group. And don't be afraid to introduce yourself or ask any questions. Thank you.
learning from experience. So um, now I'm gonna tell you a retrospective uh, um, on my journey and how you can do better. So um, I'm always, when I'm working in a project, trying to actually retrospect on, on how I can improve. Um, in this case, um, having a plan and iterate is important. For example, things can change. COVID came in, um, my father got sick, so I have to readjust my plans for that. And dealing with uncertainty is part of the journey. Another uh, retrospective that I have is do not rush. Take your time to absorb and be curious. Don't go through courses and just watch the videos. But if you don't understand a concept, maybe just go and check what it actually means. If maybe there is someone else who is struggling with the same concept. And work on projects that interest you because at the end, it will is a good way to discover and learn um, applying what you actually learn uh, in theory. Sorry. Now, what could I have done differently? And uh, maybe what can you do differently? Um, is don't be afraid to dive into practice. Um, I think this is one of the best uh, advices that I could give, because if I retrospect back to a few years, um, I would say to the Laura from three years ago, I started practicing earlier. The other one is uh, reading papers as um, basically you get to know how the algorithms work and how you could use them or how maybe you can turn some parameters. And more importantly is learning about the state of the art topics in your area of interest. And then the last one is retrospect often because it will allow you to actually change your directions. I'm constantly doing, kind of, I started using poly work and in poly work, I um, use it like a journaling method. Like, okay, today I learned this and maybe I struggled with this concept or that concept. So um, with this, um, I think I'm done with my talk. I hope you enjoyed. Um, feel free to reach me out in Twitter. Now I'm going to introduce Margaret, who will be also sharing her journey into ML. Thank you, Laura. Hello, everyone. I'm Margaret from Seattle. I'm a machine learning engineer and artist working on applying AI to art and design. I'm a community leader leading Google Developer Group Seattle chapter and the Seattle Data Analytics and Machine Learning. Um, I'm a machine learning GDE. I contribute to open source TensorFlow projects and taught Android at University of Washington. I really enjoy art and design, so I spend a lot of time practicing drawing and painting. Check out this gallery with my artwork made with traditional and digital tools and also AI art. Today, I will share with you how I got started with AI and machine learning, some learning resources, and my machine learning GDE experience, including some of the open source projects that I worked on. Here's a timeline of my journey into AI and machine learning from an entry engineer to a machine learning engineer. In 2016, I got started in the field and I've been learning and sharing my knowledge since then. In 2018, I became a machine learning GDE. Since then, I have contributed to a lot of open source TensorFlow projects. This summer, I even got invited to mentor Google Summer of Code students for the TensorFlow organization. So here's how I got started. In early 2016, for my um, day job, I had the opportunity to work on Android apps that showcase machine learning. At that time, TensorFlow was just released as an open source library not long ago. I gave a talk called Making Android Apps with Intelligence at an Android conference and afterwards at several other conferences. Although my talk was mostly focused on how to add intelligence to Android apps without much machine learning knowledge, I got really curious about what is under the hood and decided that I will study machine learning. So I put together a study plan for myself and started learning. In 2016, I learned how to program in Python, refreshed linear algebra and calculus. I also refreshed my knowledge in descriptive and inferential stats. Then I started studying machine learning basics. Since 2016, I have taken many online courses, read a lot of books, 
and a lot of uh, machine learning blog posts and research papers. Between 2017 and 2018, I have studied all the online deep learning programs from Udacity, Coursera, Stanford, MIT, and FastAI. In 2019, um, I have also completed an advanced computer vision nano degree from Udacity. Although I have worked on generative deep learning since 2018, as soon as the new Coursera GANs specialization came out, I uh, completed the program. Earlier this year, I got certified as a TensorFlow developer. I took the Coursera course and passed the certificate exam. The course consists of four sections, intro, CNN, NLP, and time series. I've been working on TensorFlow since 2016, so the exam was fairly easy for me. I studied and took the certificate exam anyways, so that I could share my experience with others and help them pass the exam. I made a YouTube video and wrote a blog post about it, both of which illustrated with my sketch notes. This year, I also completed the Coursera specialization on TensorFlow Advanced Techniques specialization. There are four courses. Uh, course one is on custom models, layers, and loss functions. The second course is on custom and distributed training. Third one is on advanced computer vision, and the fourth one is generative deep learning, which is a topic that I'm very interested in. So even if you have worked on TensorFlow for a while, I highly recommend this specialization for you to get yourself familiarized with TensorFlow 2. Knowledge sharing benefits others, and it's also a great way for me to continue learning. I have written many machine learning blog posts on Medium, um, for publications such as Turbo's Data Science and the Startup, and also written blog posts for the official TensorFlow blog. In the past few years, I have written more than 40 machine learning related blog posts with more than 250,000 people reading them. I have also given many machine learning talks with over 5,000 people attending my talks altogether. A lot of my knowledge sharing was also through organizing events and speaking at conferences. TensorFlow and Deep Learning Without a PhD was one of the many GDG Seattle events I organized where Martin Gorner was the speaker for the event, and we had a huge turnout for the two-session uh, event. It was great to see how machine learning became so accessible to the average developers. Here's another example of knowledge sharing. In 2018, I attended TensorFlow Dev Summit for the very first time, and I wrote a blog post on what I learned from the event. And then I organized the TensorFlow Dev Summit Extended at GDG Seattle and gave a talk there about the new TensorFlow features I learned from the summit. TensorFlow Dev Summit 2019 was a great event, hanging out with the other machine learning GDEs. Uh, I shared what I learned again with a blog post and my sketch notes. As I mentioned earlier, I became a machine learning GDE in 2018. GDE is a program where Google recognized individuals for our expertise in, particular, uh, in a particular technology area and the community contribution. The machine learning GDE program uh, is a great community for me to network and collaborate with many experts around the world. Since I became a machine learning GDE, I have, have contributed to many open source projects. In 2018, I wrote tutorials for tensorflow.org. For example, in collaboration with machine learning GDE Shatiz, I wrote the transfer learning and fine tuning tutorial. I also helped write the DC GAN tutorial. In 2019, I led the TensorFlow Doc Spring project during TensorFlow 2.0 launch in collaboration with Paige and Sergey. It was a project that helped improve the documentation of TensorFlow. Over 9,000 API docs were updated and many events took place around the globe in 15 countries. This project has had such a huge impact on TensorFlow. It even got mentioned during the TensorFlow World keynote. Last year, I created an awesome uh, list for TensorFlow Lite uh, with the support of the TensorFlow Lite team and the GDE community. It includes the official TensorFlow Lite models and the models created by the community. It has sample apps, end-to-end -end tutorials, books, blog posts, and video courses. Check it out if you are interested in learning more about TensorFlow Lite. 
and on-device machine learning. In 2020, uh, last year, I collaborated with machine learning GD Sanyak on quite a few TensorFlow projects. This one is the selfie to animate project. And there were a, a couple of other projects such as uh, a cartoonizer, you take a picture and then convert it to a cartoon and then also back, background stylizer in collaboration with Sanyak, George and uh, Patrick. And uh, basically you take a picture and then segment the background and stylize the background. Earlier this year, I helped to launch the Machine Learning GD YouTube channel, our own YouTube channel, in collaboration with Jerry, Daniel, Leslie, Shatiz, and many Machine Learning GDs contributed their video content. So check it out. Make sure you subscribe to our Machine Learning GD channel. This summer, I was invited to be a mentor for the TensorFlow organization for Google Summer of Code. I mentored or co-mentored at least three students in these product areas, TensorFlow GAN, TensorFlow Model Garden, and the TensorFlow Hub and TensorFlow Lite. I have included a link to my blog post for you to read about my mentoring experience and the projects of my students. I hope you enjoyed listening to my journey into AI and the machine learning and my machine learning GDE experience. Thanks everyone for attending my talk today. Please keep in touch and follow me on Twitter, Medium, and GitHub. Next, please welcome Nikita to share with us her story. Thanks, Margaret. All right. So hi, everyone. My name is Nikita, and I'm a developer advocate at Google. And today, I'm going to share with you a little bit about how I went from writing poetry to writing code. So like many people, I was very inspired by Ada Lovelace, but probably not for the same reasons most people are. So you probably have heard of her as the first computer programmer, um, but I didn't learn that about her until many years later. When I was younger, I always knew Ada Lovelace as the daughter of the poet Lord Byron. And actually when Ada was a young child, her mother taught her mathematics and logic kind of um, as an antidote to her father's unreliable, romantic, frivolous character. And she believed that an education in math would prevent her from turning into her father, the poet. So when I was growing up, I, I identified as a poet and a writer, and that's kind of how I saw myself. That's what I thought I would grow up to be. And my parents were very encouraging of, of my poetic tendencies, but they also never really let me give up on math, even though it was something that never came naturally to me. I had to work really hard at it. It didn't come easily like writing did, um, but they never let me give up. And so as a result, poetry and mathematics became these two very, very strong forces in my life when I was growing up, just like Ada Lovelace. And when I went to college, I decided to double major in English literature and pure mathematics. And that might sound like a very strange combination, but my hope is that by the end of my short talk today, it might make a little bit of sense. So one of the books that I read for my English degree is called Player Piano. It's by Kurt Vonnegut, and it's this dark satirical novel where Vonnegut describes this world in which society no longer has any value for people who aren't engineers. So essentially, if you're not an engineer, you get sent off to live in this eerily perfect, like kind of sad neighborhood called the homestead, and that's where you live the rest of your life. And there's a point in the novel where the rebel engineer, who is named Finnerty, he says, if it weren't for the people always getting tangled up in the machinery, if it weren't for them, the world would be an engineer's paradise. And so when I read this book, I was in a classroom at college surrounded by my fellow poets and writers. And we thought this idea was so strange because everything in our humanities education had taught us to think about problems and think about things, you know, from the perspective of the human at the center. Um, and so we thought this was a very strange idea, right? This is why we wrote essays. This is why we wrote poetry. But now that I've had a career in engineering, um, I kind of understand what Vonnegut's saying here. And I think what he's trying to communicate is just how much harder and more complex designing technology becomes when we start to think about how it will be used and by whom in the real world. And so after I read this book, I became very inspired to start to research um, kind of the impact of technology on people and how that's expressed in literature. 
So my college thesis was actually looking at um, how scientific advancements in the mid-century in obstetrics had fo focused um, very much on making childbirth as clean and efficient as possible, but really neglected to protect female autonomy and the kind of emotional experience of childbirth. And I looked at how this was expressed through the poetry of female writers in the US in the 1950s. And that might sound like a completely crazy thing to write your thesis on, but if you had a liberal arts education like I did, it probably sounds totally on brand. So that was kind of my plan. I was gonna continue to study this impact of technology and how that's expressed through poetry. And I was gonna go and get a PhD in English. And that's kind of what I thought I was gonna do with my life. Um, but everyone said, you know, take a year off and go out in the real world and get a job for a year before you go into academia. So I did that and I ended up getting a job working in marketing at a small um, startup. I think maybe about, I was probably employee number 30 um, and it happened to be an AI startup. So I had never heard the phrase machine learning. Um, this was sort of right at that time, but kind of like about a year or so before machine learning and AI became the, you know, the things that they are now before they became really, really popular. Um, and I don't even think we used the phrase AI when I, when I first started there, it was sort of not even fashionable at that time. But um, kind of over the first few months of working there, I became really good friends with the machine learning engineers. I would sit with them at lunch and I learned two things. So the first thing I learned is that Kurt Vonnegut was kind of right, like thinking about the kind of broader impact and application of, of technology has just historically not been part of an engineer's job description. And I thought that was very strange, especially in a field like machine learning, where you're you know building tools for people and you're using data created by people. So how can you not think about the human at the center of everything? So that was the first thing I learned. Um, the second thing I learned was that this machine learning stuff was kind of cool. And I was actually really interested in it, even though it was something I had you know previously never heard of. And so I started to kind of wonder, okay, maybe instead of just writing about the impact of technology on people, maybe I could actually be part of, you know, shaping that narrative in real time. Um, and so when I, when I kind of think back to this early part of my career, there are so many moments where I think I really felt like I needed to apologize for having gone off and studied English literature and pure math and had two degrees that really had no practical application in the world. Um, but if I could tell my younger self something, it wouldn't be to go have gone back and you know, to have done a computer science degree. It would have been just that I don't think you need to apologize for your background. Um, and I think like, having diversity in thought and education is truly what's going to build a stronger machine learning community and ultimately, you know, better machine learning tools for society, especially in a field like ML, which is um, so interdisciplinary. And I don't think there's any one path or any one way to becoming a machine learning engineer. So if you're someone who has really strong software engineering skills, like that's amazing. Um, Machine learning without strong, so, uh, without software engineering is, you know, it's just a Jupyter notebook running on someone's computer. Or maybe you're someone who has a background in biology and you can be a really critical subject matter expert in applying machine learning to the natural sciences. So I think to take your career kind of to the next level, I really believe it's about figuring out what you can uniquely bring and how that sort of fits into solving the broader problems um, with machine learning. And for me, I knew that was really... Um, being able to bring a unique perspective to how we design machine learning, specifically because of my humanities education. Um, but first I had to learn to code. So I, I even though I had studied pure math um, and you know most of my classes were things like number theory and the structure of modern geometry where we literally just drew um, shapes with colored pencils and a compass for the entire class. Um, I still knew enough like linear algebra and probability and calculus that like picking up some of the basics of machine learning wasn't too complicated. What was really hard was that I knew nothing about software or about computers and I hadn't written any code since 2002 when I operated a Neopet site for like four weeks as a small child and wrote four lines of HTML code. So I knew nothing, um, but I had written two novels at the, or two books at this point. I published a novel and I'd also been commissioned to write um, the memoir for a media heiress. So I was like, I can write books. Like, of course I can write code. How hard can this be? So what I did is I actually went to the ML team and I told them like, okay, I want to learn what it is that you guys do. I've taken some, you know, random courses on the internet. Can you give me a project? 
Um, and they, in their big stack of projects, there was one project that involved writing some JavaScript. And because they were all research engineers and machine learning, no one wanted to do that project. Like no one wanted to go near it. So they told me, okay, can, if you can figure this out, like then then we'll talk. So what I did is I spent three weeks um, trying to figure out how computers work. How do you write code? What is any of this? And I wrote some terrible JavaScript that had a, just a terrifying number of for loops in it. Um, but it worked. It was it was not great. It was pretty terrible. Uh, but it did the thing it was supposed to do. It was like visualizing kind of the results of a topic model. And I brought that to the ML team. And they actually ended up demoing it as part of um, kind of the engineering all hands um, at the end of that week. And I was terrified. Like I was so confused and so convinced that what I had written was just gonna break everything. For some reason, I thought it would break all the code in the world. Um, I was so scared. But what I kind of remember from that moment is, is just really thinking about how there was this path in my life that I always thought I would go down. And like, that was a safe path. That was a path I knew I was gonna succeed at. And then there was sort of this unknown world that I was kind of scared to step into, but really wanted to. Um, and I think like figuring out what you're passionate about does often involve taking a risk. And for me, that was really about getting comfortable with, with not being perfect at something and like getting comfortable with knowing that I was going to mess up, knowing that things were going to break and I wasn't going to do things perfectly the first time around. And that was totally okay. So I ended up actually, um, the ML team took me on as an apprentice after that, and I moved to their team and kind of, I ended up working at this company for, for about three and a, three years, I think. Um, and, you know, by the end of it, I was, I was a full machine learning engineer and I was building models and talking to customer customers and everything. Um, but in that first year when I was really learning a lot, I would always think about something my creative writing teacher in high school would say. And he'd tell us like, if you want to be a writer, you must read. And so he would, um, he had this exercise he would give us where he'd make us go and get old books that we loved. And we would just sit there with a piece of paper and a pencil and just like write the words of the book um, kind of line by line. Um, and it was this idea that in order to succeed, you have to kind of look back at the work of the people who came before you. And so I always thought about that when I was, you know, really like first learning to code. And for me, what that meant was being incredibly proactive about finding mentors. I'm like so grateful for the people who taught me and during this part of my journey. Um, and I really, what I think I did well at that time was really seeking out guidance, seeking out criticism, you know, seeking out feedback, asking for people to look at my code, like, Everything that, you know, it seems really scary to get that feedback. It can be really intimidating and really scary. But I think like that's how you build real meaningful relationships with mentors um, that stay with you for the rest of your life. So now I am a developer advocate at Google. I've been here for about three and a half years and I've had a few different jobs. Um, I actually worked uh, my first job at Google. I was working in um, sales engineering for machine learning. And then I worked in developer support for TensorFlow. And now um, I've moved to developer advocacy. And my job is really about um, enriching and, and growing the community of developers that use Google Cloud to build and create machine learning. And I get to do this by writing tutorials and um, building demos, speaking at conferences, um, creating kind of new co educational content, and then also getting feedback from the community and, and bringing that back to the product and engineering teams. And um, I think, you know, what I think I've kind of like found my, my home in developer advocacy, because it, to me, it's all about working on those problems that exist between like what engineering builds and what people and developers actually use. And there's that huge space in the middle that I see is like exactly what Vonnegut was talking about. Like that's where the human beings get in the middle and get tangled up in the machinery. And, and that's what we, we get to do with developer advocacy is work on those problems. And so I used to always joke that one day I was gonna find a job that brought together poetry and mathematics and everyone was like, there's no such thing. Um, but I think I found that with developer advocacy. It's this very unique opportunity to bring together communicating, storytelling and engineering. So when I look back on the very, I think very unusual and perhaps a little strange um, path that I took to get to where I am now. And again, you know, the last place I ever thought I would be. I never thought this is what I would, I would end up doing in my career, um, but something I really cherish from my time as a writer and a poet is, is really thinking about um, humanity at the center of everything that we do and we build and we create. And I think it can be very easy to get 
totally lost in the details and get lost in the smaller picture. And of course, all of that is incredibly important, but I don't think we can lose track of the bigger picture of what we're trying to do. And ultimately, when we work in machine learning, we are building tools for people and we're using data created by people. And so humanity really has to be at the center of absolutely everything that we do. So thank you all so much. Um, and I'm gonna pass it back to Maga now, who's gonna take us to the Q&A. Amazing. Thank you so much, Nikita. That was awesome. Um, please join me in thanking our, our panelists um, for, their, for just sharing their amazing, unique stories. Um, we're now entering the Q&A portion of this panel. Um, and to kick things off, uh, Nikita, I would love to hear your perspective on what a common misconception is about getting started in the field of machine learning or potentially working in the field of machine learning as a woman. Um, yeah, I don't know if this is maybe like specific just to being a woman, but I think there is, and this is something that I really didn't understand at first, is I think there's kind of this one idea of what a career in machine learning looks like, and it's like one type of job, and it's doing this one specific thing, you know, solving, maybe it's like building ML solutions for in a like client kind of uh, scenario. Um, and what I discovered later is how many jobs there are in machine learning and just like this variety of like from product management to developer support to product engineering to you know design there is such a wide range of jobs that involve working with machine learning really closely and i think sometimes we only think just of the software engineering perspective and even within that there's such a huge range so i think one like misconception is just not knowing the wide variety of actual career options that there are within the field of ml Amazing. Margaret, anything to add to that? Uh, just one thing, short thing to add is that some people might still have the misconception that you need to have a PhD to work in the field of machine learning, AI and machine learning. But um, I, I feel like right now AI and machine learning is so accessible to everyone. Um, as uh, Nikita mentioned earlier, like engineering is very important uh, for machine learning as well. Amazing. Um, to add to that question, have you um, have you ever felt imposter syndrome working in this space? And, and if so, how did you deal with that, Margaret? Uh, yes. Um, how do I deal with it? I seem to remember one friend, somebody said, if you feel the imposter syndrome, uh, perhaps take out a notebook and list out, I don't know, 10 things, a long list of things of your uh, accomplishments in the field. And uh, don't go compare yourself with others, but just look at your own accomplishments. Laura, any advice to add to that on, on how to battle imposter syndrome? You're muted. Sorry about that. Sure, apologies. Um, so as Margaret said, it's important to not compare against other. Um, and my husband, actually, he reminds me that every time that I kind of fell into imposter syndrome. So he um, asked me, like, do a retrospection um, on yourself, go back, right? Back in time and know how you are now. And I think that's important and it will help you uh, to realize that um, everyone has their own journey and uh, you don't have to be like others. Um, so that's uh, one thing that I kind of have on my mind every day. Absolutely. Um, Laura, you mentioned the importance of getting a mentor. Um, can you tell us a little bit about how a mentor has impacted your machine learning journey or career um, and any advice that you have to the audience on how best to find a mentor and curate that relationship. Sure. So um, I'm going to um, do a bit of storytelling. In 2015, I got to travel to as a part of the GDG program, Google Developer Group, um, to Google I.O. And in there, I was uh, watching all the talks. I was super excited. And I met Lawrence Moroni. Um, right. And then we got coffee and we started chatting and he, he, I was telling him like, oh, I'm interested in too much learning. And he actually advised like, oh, maybe you can get started, uh, uh, check out the Stanford course. 
And I remember that I, when I got home, I started looking into it. I was like, wow, this is so difficult. Um, but actually, um, it's one of the best advice that I could get, right? Um, because I did the course once, and then the second time I was like, wow, this is it's just like, okay, I need to build up on um, some skills. And um, with this story, what I get to tell is like uh, mentors can be found and maybe uh, organically, right? Like you can grow a mentor organically, like you can have a mentor that grows um, with you. And for example, I have multiple opportunities with the GDG program as well. And I think that's a way, a good way to actually find a mentor because when you are in a community, you get to know a lot of people. Uh, and that's a good way. And also there is a lot of strangers in your path that are always able to help. For example, when I, when I was applying for Stanford, I remember seeing a tweet from a manager in Docker who actually said, I'm, I'm able to do uh, reviews in CVs. And I actually ping him like, hey, could you review my statement of purpose? And it might seem like he's not mentoring, but actually it was. He advised me like, oh, maybe you could write this way the letter, or maybe you could improve this, or maybe this is not relevant. So I think it's, uh, it's just a matter of maybe, I know there is people who is shy and um, sometimes I'm shy, but I was like, okay, I'll, I'll go and ask questions and ask people if they could help. And if they cannot, it's fine too. So, yep. Yeah. Nikita, you also mentioned the importance of mentors. Um, how did you find one or many and, and how did they impact you? Yeah, I think I've I've had been really lucky and had I I think a lot of mentors in my mm -hmm. career and definitely just from the very beginning, you know, the people who took a chance on me, even though I had absolutely no coding experience um, and were willing to teach me. And I think what I really learned from that experience is is just not being scared to to kind of get someone to critique your work when you, it can be really scary to just like receive that kind of constructive criticism. It can sometimes feel like an attack or like you could make you feel vulnerable. Um, but that at the end of the day, like that's really how you grow and that's how you build better relationships with people. Um, so even, you know, since then with the people who I would consider now to be mentors, um, I always, I think it's really important when you meet with mentors, you meet with people who you, you know, you want to get advice from to really go in with a plan and like, don't just show up and kind of, you know, um, you know, show up, show up with a plan, know what you want to ask them and be very open to, to hearing their feedback. I think that's really, really important. Definitely. Um, I fully agree. Uh, Margaret, I'd love to hear a little bit more about you know, what initially drew you to the field of machine learning? And more importantly, what excites you about its future? Uh, as I mentioned in my talk, how I got started, it was I was working on Android apps that use machine learning models. And even though I wasn't really required to understand machine learning, that's probably what drew me into the field of AI machine learning and started to learn uh, a lot about it. And what I'm right now, what I'm most excited about uh, AI machine learning is how to uh, apply that to art and design to help, you know, create team arts or, or design assets or maybe coloring. Um, you know, machine learning can be applied to many different domains and fields. But for me, that's what I feel most excited about is art and design. Nikita, how about yourself? What is a current or future ML trend that really excites you the most? Um, I, I'm really excited about looking at how we can use machine learning for um, problems in sustainability and the environment. So this is something that I just personally care a lot about. You can tell by all my houseplants. Um, <laughs> it's something that is just really, I'm really very passionate about. Um, and there are a ton of really interesting um, new use cases and new ways to take a bunch of geospatial data and solve problems with machine learning that, you know, traditionally have been solved by hand on our very, it's very, very time consuming. It's hard to do a lot of this in real time. Um, and so kind of like Margaret said, you know, she's interested in like this design and art and like for me, and this is looking at machine learning and, and how we can take this in the field of, of um, in the environment and sustainability. Yeah, uh, Laura, anything to add to that? Yes, sure. So um, I would say um, the one trend or area that I'm more excited about is healthcare. 
I think uh, if everyone uh, works into making healthcare more affordable and maybe using AI and machine learning uh, for these people who are not able to pay or maybe they can access it um, as fast as possible, that would be a, a huge breakthrough. So, yep. That's awesome. Um, I guess my, my next question is, is what is next for you? Uh, you know, what haven't you done in your career and what would you like to do next? Um, Laura, please kick it off. Sure. So uh, as I mentioned in my talk, I will be starting in the next couple of weeks on AI program in Stanford. Mm -hmm. And after that, I will probably looking, uh, be looking to join a company. And if I'm uh, lucky enough, then I'll, I'll be super happy to join any company that will work towards um, maybe healthcare um, or education in AI. Um, I think that's uh, the next step in my journey. Awesome. And Margaret? sharing one another. <laughs> awesome. Margaret, how about you? What's next? Uh, yeah, for me, it's still art and design. That's what I feel most passionate about. Awesome. And, and Nikita? I'm fairly new to the developer advocacy role, so I feel like I'm still kind of settling into that and there's a lot that I, I really want to do. I think one thing that I find so exciting is just being able to create educational content that you can put out in the world and people who, you know, you know, you don't, you don't have to get that computer science degree to learn these things. And so what I really love is just taking, you know, kind of these complicated things that subjects that seem complicated or things that seem complicated and figuring out how I can break them down and communicate them so that, you know, someone with an English literature degree can can watch a YouTube video and learn about this thing. And that can inspire them to, you know, go and pursue a career in machine learning. And so that's, I think for me is like, what's next is just really continuing down this path and hopefully building more educational content that really helps people who, you know, have different backgrounds to, to learn more about ML. Awesome. Um, Margaret, you mentioned the, the MLGD as, as kind of part of your path to machine learning. Um, how did it advance your career? Uh, I think the MLGD community is really a great, as I mentioned earlier, a great place to network and, and to collaborate with other uh, MLGD. So through the many of the open source projects that I've done, you know, I have people like reaching out to me, asking me to give talks. And I also through the knowledge sharing, um, you know, writing uh, tutorials and presenting, I, I feel like there's a lot of times people reaching out to me uh, with opportunities because they have uh, learned from my talks or my blog posts that I've written. Amazing. Um, I think we have time for one more question. And so I'd love to close it off um, with all of you sharing just, you know, one piece of advice that you'd want the audience member to keep in, in mind. Um, Nikita, why don't you kick this off? Yeah, I, I think I talked a little bit about this in, in my, my talk, but I think that would be this idea of, you know, getting comfortable with, with making mistakes and a little bit of imperfection and not doing everything perfectly the first time around. Um, I really struggle with that. I think honestly, today I still struggle with that, but the most important, I think like the biggest um, kind of changes in my career and the, the best things that have happened have always come from pushing myself to do something that I don't really know how to do and like take that chance. And even if you, you know, you stumble a little bit, that's completely fine. And no one expects you to do something perfectly the first time around. That's okay. And that's how you grow and figure out what it is that you, you really love and want to do. I love that. I think that's awesome advice. Margaret, how about you? Uh, for me, my advice is like, never be afraid to be a beginner. Every expert, you know, so called, so called expert started uh, somewhere as a beginner. So, yeah, I, I like what Nikita said earlier, don't apologize for your background, you know, whether you are an artist, uh, a designer, a PM, or a poet, or a mathematician, you know, you want to learn something, just pick it up and learn. That's another gem. I love it. Um, Laura, close us off. Any advice for the audience? Sure. I think um, more on the line with Nikita, um, 
being afraid of making mistakes uh, can make you feel um, this imposter syndrome. But when you get rid of that, you unlock uh, like a, a new path, a new um, world, right? And one of the things that happened to me is um, is when I was doing courses in the past, like maybe six years ago, I was just watching the videos and that was it. And then I kind of said, okay, why this knowledge is not sticking at all, right? And there is two things. And the first one is um, practicing is important. So you get to actually settle your knowledge down. And then the second one is um, if you don't know something, if you're struggling with a concept, just try to dive into someone else's resources because there is a lot of people who actually is open to share knowledge. So, and there is a lot of information on the internet. Um, as you can get overwhelmed by it, but if you try to find it, um, you will find the answer. So, yeah, yeah I love advice. advice. I, I totally agree with that. I, I also kind of had to teach myself machine learning um, when I joined the TensorFlow team. And, and a lot of the courses that you guys mentioned um, in your slides were, were all courses that I did. So I highly recommend them um, to people in the audience that, that want to get a deeper knowledge. Um, that's all we have time for uh, today. So thank you so much for joining us. Um, please join us back on the mainstream for the final set of speakers. Mm -hmm.